Um, but I learned something uh, as we were kind of going through this process uh, of getting this together. I learned something more about the quarry walk and about this area and kind of behind the, the, the greater vision of what this place is all about. And, and, I, and I learned that, uh, that wellness is something that uh, is very important to, uh, to the people at the highest levels uh, here and, and that they are focusing on the whole person becoming whole. And, uh, and, and how many know that we are broken people? <laughs> amen? Any broken people in the house right here? Hi, amen, amen. And so, and so we, we generally understand that as a, as a person, uh, we are made up of body, mind, soul, spirit, amen? And, um, and that all of those things need to be working properly in order for us to be whole. So the reason why somebody might go to a spa to get a deep tissue massage or seek out counseling or, or life coach, which, by the way, can I just say something about counseling? There is absolutely zero shame in going to see a counselor. Amen? Go see a counselor. Go talk to somebody. Um, there, the, but the reason why somebody would, would go to counseling or, or, or maybe a marriage, they go to see marriage, seek marriage counseling, or, or perhaps um, you start eating whole foods, you know, or, or maybe uh, the reason why you started going to the church or started a prayer regiment, there's something that has happened in the background, and most likely, and in most cases, you hit a wall in your life. There's something that, that, that happened that, that, uh, that orchestrated that change or that shift uh, inside of you. Uh, perhaps the doctor is uh, telling you that you've got to change your diet because, bam, you've got diabetes. Or, or maybe uh, you've got a new cardio, uh, cardio regimen because the doc is telling you that if you don't change your ways, then bad things are going to happen. Maybe you're, taking, you, 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 you're talking um, to a, a counselor or to a life coach because uh, you just, you've got to unpack some of the hurts from your past that you've suppressed and pressed down for so long and, and you thought that you were behind, it was behind you, but it, it truly is still hanging in there. And maybe, maybe you just had a particularly difficult month uh, deadlines at, at work and you had to go to the spa just to get relief, you know, and just to get that, treat yourself to a nice massage. And, uh, but, but the reality is, is that, that all of us here, every man here, every woman, every child, young and old, all find ourselves in life where we're just going through life and things are fine and things are going well and everything's good and all of a sudden, bam, life hits you in the face. Anybody had that happen? Amen? Everybody. Okay, so we're, we are in good company. So can, I, can we just let, let all the masks down today and just understand that, that God has something for every single person here because the truth of the matter is we can appear to be the most well put together person on the planet, but life has a way of getting us into a tangled mess all of a sudden, and we didn't ask for it. It just landed in our laps. And this week for me was, and for my family, was especially, and listen, some of you are like, is he going to pray? He better pray. He's got to pray over this sermon. I'm going to pray, I promise you. We're getting there. This is the intro to the intro. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I want to tell you, you know, this, this week for, for my family was particularly sensitive because it was, uh, it was on, on this past Wednesday marked, uh, was, a, was an important marker of when we landed into a big mess. Life was going on. Uh, we were we were kind of new to the church still, just to, about eighteen months into the church, and um, the, everything was growing, and ministries were happening, and people were happy, and it was I mean it, everything from a pastor's side of the desk that needed to happen was happening, and it looked like success on every side, and and uh, and 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 all of a sudden I get a phone call uh, from my wife, and she says I just got the diagnosis, it's cancer. Five years ago this past Wednesday, that completely turned our life upside down. How many you know that's true? You, it, in, in one phone call, you can find yourself in a mess, and you're not prepared for it. And, and now I'm, I'm happy to, to announce today, as God is my 
uh, Savior and Lord and Redeemer and Healer that my wife is five years cancer-free. Amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. As of last Wednesday. But, but life, life is like this. Oftentimes, we're just, we're just moving through. We're just trying to be good people. We're just, we're just trying to, to be good citizens, do the right thing, make an honest living. And then all of a sudden, bam, life just gets you. The boiler goes out. Uh, Mike, the thermostat stops working. That happened to him yesterday. <laughs> uh, the, 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 the kids eat all the snacks in the cupboard, and now it's, now it's on, you know. <laughs> and, 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 and so all across this green this morning, and to all of you who are watching us live today, let me encourage you that if you have found yourself in the middle of a mess and you didn't ask for it, you just, you're just in it, I want to encourage you today to seek Jesus in your middle. Seek after Jesus in the middle. Because the Bible tells us in Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 13 that when you seek him, you will find him, amen, that he is here to be found. So, Father, I just pray in the name that's above every name, in the name of Jesus Christ, Yeshua, our King, our Lord, our provider, our God, I pray, Lord, that you would bless these next few minutes. Father, as we unpack your word, and God, as we leave here, encouraged to know how to deal with the owl in our life. And I pray, God, that you would just bless every ear to hear what the Spirit has to say. Soften hearts that have been so hardened to you, God. Lord, I pray, Father God, that instead of shaking our fist at you, Lord, we would open up our hands in praise and thanksgiving and recognize that you are our source. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, when my family was going through that season, we sought after God. And God answered. And most of the time, in my context, he answers me through the Bible. Uh, in this instance, my mother-in-law, Pastor Grant's wife, Ethel, she was in the Word, and God gave her an anchor scripture that she shared with us post-diagnosis. That scripture was John chapter 11 and verse 4. It's our anchor scripture for today. This is what it said. It says, when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now, John chapter 11 is the famous story of Lazarus. Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus, rising from the dead. And, and so I find, I find the book of John particularly interesting because John, St. John, is made up of 21 chapters, 10 in the front, 10 in the back, but smack in the middle is chapter 11, and, and this is where we find the story of Lazarus. Now, the 10 chapters in the front, everything's going great. Everything is happening on the right way for, uh, for, uh, for Jesus. In John chapter 2, he turns water into wine. In John chapter 4, he prophesies over the Samaritan woman. In John chapter 5, he heals a lame man at the pool of Bethesda. In John chapter 6, he feeds 5,000 people with some donuts from, uh, from the baking company, Oxford Baking Company. <laughs> Which, uh, I'm kidding. Don't get mad at me and send me an email. A few loaves and some fish. And then later in chapter 6, we see that his disciples are stuck in a storm and Jesus comes walking on the water. We see in John chapter 9 that Jesus heals a man that had been born blind. All we're seeing in the first 10 chapters of this book are miracle after miracle after success after success, win after win after win. But now we're in the middle. We're in the middle of this book. And Jesus is in the middle of his earthly ministry. And I find it wonderfully familiar that things that seem to be going amazing for Jesus, that when everything seems to be going exactly a house, even when he's facing some persecution, he just has these words from the Holy Spirit that shut the mouth of the enemy. And over and over and over again, he is finding success. But now he's in chapter 11. 
everything is going great. And then sometimes we find ourselves in chapter 11, right in the middle of the story. Because in this story, Jesus receives news that strikes, that, that cuts him deep into his heart. See, can I tell you that the enemy, your enemy, how many know you have an enemy? Can I tell you something? Let me just pause for just a minute. We are upon Halloween this year. Can I tell you something? The glorification of the darkness is no place for the children of light, okay? The devil is not your friend, okay? The devil is not your, he is not your, your, uh, your, 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 your companion. The enemy has an agenda. It is to steal, to kill, and to destroy your life. That's what he wants to do. So he wants you to play around with darkness. He wants to toy around with your spirit. But here we are in the middle. And, and so can I tell you that the enemy will always, always try to disrupt your victories during the middle of your successes. Listen to me. The enemy will always try to disrupt your victories in the middle of your successes. So it's here that the enemy tries to get Jesus to file chapter 11. <laughs> Thank you for getting that. As we know, chapter 11 is the U.S. bankruptcy code. And, and chapter 11 is what you do when there's nothing else left to do. Chapter 11 is what you do when there is no more hope. There's no more avenues. There's nothing else to be done. It's, you just got to fold up shop. You, you got to cut your losses and just move on. And that's what the enemy wants you to do. He wants you to fold up shop. He wants you to give up on this new life in Christ. He wants you to think that it's so hard being a Christian. He wants you to believe that you are financially and emotionally and physically and spiritually bankrupt. And he wants you to find yourself in your chapter 11. You see, Jesus is being challenged here. And after chapter uh, 10, after all these 10 chapters of, of victory, of this overwhelming victory, he learns that his, one of his dearest friends, Lazarus, is dying. And he gets news of, of this. And so, and so I want to walk you through this powerful and transparent passage of Scripture so that we can understand Jesus' instructions to us when you're in your chapter 11. So let me open up with John chapter 11, verse 1. It says this. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. This Mary, was the brother, was, uh, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. Verse 3. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. And so this is where we get that anchor, anchor scripture at. Jesus says, when he heard this, this, this sickness will not end in death. He prophesied. He wasn't there. He was, he was uh, somewhere else. But he said, I, I prophesy over him that this sickness will not end in death. No, it's for God's glory. It's for God's glory. It's for God's glory. Listen, sometimes you got to go through it, but it's for God's glory so that God's son will be glorified through it. Now, listen, I... I I mentioned something last week in our uh, service, and I'm going to mention it again today because I think it's noteworthy. How many of you know that God is good? H how often is God good? God is good, and all the time. Okay, so if God is good all the time, and all the time God is good, and the Bible tells us that he is infinite and he never changes, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, that means that he is always, always, always good. And if you're always good, you cannot be sometimes bad. Amen? So if there is bad that's happening in your life, listen to me, it's not God's fault. It's not his fault. God is good. God is good. Now listen. So, so, so Genesis chapter 50 verse 20 illustrates this. It says, for as for me, you meant, this is, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people's lives. How many of you here could say, I went through a hardship, a difficult time, a trial, a temptation, but because I went through it, I was able to bless somebody else 
because God was faithful to me, he was faithful to them also. Amen? That's what that scripture means. And so, and so God does not cause our painful experiences. Listen, we live in a broken world. We already, we already confess we're all a mess. Amen? Look at your neighbor say, I'm a mess, but you're worse. That's, that's how hurt people make themselves feel better. We live in a sinful, broken, messed up world, church. But it's where we live. So, so listen, he, he, he most certainly will use your painful experiences, your middle, amen, your chapter 11, for his glory and to display his power in your life. Max Lucado said it this way, famous author and communicator. He said, he, of Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, he said, in God's hands, intended evil becomes eventual good. In God's hands, intended evil becomes eventual good. See, it's wired into the DNA of creation. Everything around you, the, the rocks that are, that are around you, the trees that are around you, the people that you know, everywhere you go, all of creation will give God glory. There's coming a day where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. When the, when the Pharisees told Jesus to tell his disciples to shut up, he said, I could do that, but if I tell them to shut up, the rocks are going to cry out and praise me. Creation is designed to worship the creator. And so God will receive glory, if not now, eventually. And so God receives glory in two ways. God receives glory through our now and through our ow. Amen? Or I can do it this way so you guys don't feel bad. Through our now and through our ow. Amen? How he receives glory in our now is this. That's when we see the immediate miraculous work or hand of God over our life. This is when we pray, and like you got, you get fired or laid off, and you go home, and you pray, and the next day they call you up, and they say, we want to make you the CEO. That's the miraculous hand of God. That's the right now. Now, just for an encouragement, and I'm, I'm serious about this. How many of you can raise your hand and say, God has blessed me in the now in my life? I've seen a miracle in my, wow, wow to the now. Come on. I've seen it too. We have so many instances. So, so don't tell me that God doesn't still work. He is powerful and moving mightily. Last, I, had, I have one for you. Last week, I shared with you my, my infinite frustration of, with this state for taking away my plastic bags. Let me tell you how good God is. I went to my board meeting on Tuesday, and our buddy, our worship leader, Mike Taylor, showed up with a case of plastic bags. I brought one for all of you. I hand them out, $10 a piece. <laughs> plastic bags, I don't know where I'm doing with them. Now I'm tongue in cheek on that, but don't you love it that when, when God says yes, even to what seems like the most insignificant needs, these are right now miracles. This is what, remember John chapter 1 through 10, were all these right now miracles. That's what John chapter 9 was about, about when the, uh, when, when the blind man was, was healed. That blind man didn't do anything to, to earn blindness. He was born that way. His parents weren't sinful. They were God-fearing people. It's just life. And life hit him sideways, and he was blind his whole life. But Jesus healed him for the glory of God, his Father. And sometimes we see God be glorified because of the now. But sometimes, and more often, we see him glorified through our owl. Ever had an owie? <laughs> Ever had an owie before? Thank you, honey. I don't know where that came from. Okay. I'm not even going to ask. I don't want to know what happened. But God, you're sore. Say amen. And here's what I mean by God's glory. God receives glory because people will victoriously endure suffering through the power of his grace. You will victoriously endure the situation through the power of his grace. In other words, 
you know, listen, there, there was nothing that could have prepared the Willis family for cancer. We didn't have a cancer exit strategy. We had not talked about that. It wasn't on our radar. She went in for a checkup, and she came back with a diagnosis. And now we are just in the middle of it. But God, in his infinite grace, gave us the strength to endure every step of the way. And by the way, he gave us an amazing body that supported us and wrapped their arms around us all the time. We were in that thing together. Remember the bracelets you guys made? I was so blessed. So, so God gives us the endurance to get through the suffering by the power of his grace. Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians 12, 7. He said, because of the surpassing great revelations, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Watch this, verse 8. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. You know what he's saying? Lord, I want the now. I want it now. I want it now. I want to be healed now. Three, how many want that? Lord, just take it away. Three times he prayed that, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. That's the owl. Either way, God gets glorified. So no matter if it comes through the now or through the ow, you will have the strength to endure it for his glory. So what do you do when you're in the ow? What do you do when you're in the middle? What do you do when your chapter 11 has made itself known to you? I want to read on verse 5 of the story of Lazarus. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister uh, and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. What? Your best friend's dying. Okay, I'll be there in a couple days. Now listen, he was only two miles away. Think about this. I just, I, we did, several of us just did the 5K walk, the Seymour Pink walk. Uh, as a church, we had a group and, and, and we did that. And, and that's what, 3.2 miles, is that right? The 5K? And it took me like 40 minutes to walk it. It's not a far walk. Jesus is two miles away. And the Bible says, the Bible says that he heard this news and he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to the disciples, let's go back to Judea. Verse 11, after he had said this, he went to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going to wake him up. And his disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. And Jesus had been speaking of his death, but the disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Skip down to verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Mar Mar Martha and Mary to comfort them and the loss of their brother. And when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to see him, to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Verse 21, Lord, listen to this. Martha said, Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know that he will rise again on the resurrection in the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Now watch this. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? And herein lies the mystery of the middle. And this is what I want to I want to show you something very quickly. Watch this. The way you get through your owl, the way that you navigate, the way that you get whole is the first thing you got to do, do is you got to know. You got to know what you believe. You got to know. You remember G.I. Joe's big tagline, knowings? Four of, four of you knew that. That's, that's awesome. I'm going to, listen, knowing is half the battle. And I will tell you, with all the different forms of health and wellness that are represented in this plaza, be it mental or physical or emotional and certainly spiritual, 
they will all, every, every, every professional, everybody's in the field, they will all tell you that your healing begins with what you believe. What do you believe? I'll never walk, I'll never walk, I'll never walk. The pain's too great, the pain's too great, the pain's too great. You got to change your thinking. You got to change the way that you believe. Jesus asks her a very profound and supernatural question. What or do you believe this? He says. Now watch this. Three verses I want to bring to your light, uh, bring to light here. Verse 21 tells us what Martha believed. Lord, Martha said, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. That's what she believes. You were late, Jesus. Verse 32 tells us what Mary believed. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and she said, Lord, if you had been here, clearly these sisters had been talking. My brother would not have died. And again, verse 37 tells us what the Jewish followers believed. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man just two chapters before, couldn't he have kept this man from dying? I think we can all relate to Mary and to Martha and to the Jewish believers. It reminds me of the man who had the demon-possessed son in Mark chapter 9 when he said, Lord, I believe, I do, I believe, but help my unbelief. I do believe, but help my unbelief. And what the man in Mark was saying, what Mary was saying, what Martha was saying, what the Jewish followers were saying is they were responding the same way that we respond, that we have enough faith to believe for what we've already seen him do. We just haven't had enough faith for this. We had faith. We believe that you could heal the sick because we've seen you heal the sick. We believe that you could turn water into wine because you already turned water into wine. I believe that you can feed 5,000 because you already fed 5,000. They had the faith in him based on what they knew he could do. But this they had no grid for. This they had no background for. This level of faith was more than they had ever seen before. See, church, faith, faith is believing not in what you've already seen. Faith is believing in what you cannot see. It's understanding that God is God in every circumstance and in every situation, no matter how big it appears. This this mountain that they were facing was much larger. This giant was much uglier. This darkness was darker than what they'd ever experienced before. When he was sick, you could have done something. You could have saved Lazarus. We know that he will be raised in the resurrection, but now he's dead. They had never seen or heard or experienced Jesus fighting with the power of death before. They had no filter for that. So we see here that they had faith for the beginning, and they they said, had you been here, and they had faith for the end, he will rise at the resurrection, but what about his middle? What about death? There's nothing anyone else can do. We might as well file chapter 11. Aren't you glad, though, that we don't just serve anyone? (laughs) We serve the one, the one, the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? You see, when you're in your middle, when you're in your struggle, you must believe. And Jesus says, you see death, but you need to get your eyes off of that death and get your eyes on me because I am life. I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? So if you're in chapter 11 this morning, ask yourself, do you have the faith to believe him for your second half? Because it ain't over for you. You've got a whole life to live ahead of you. Do you believe that he is the resurrection and the life? Resurrection means that he brings life to that which was dead. That's what resurrection means. He resurrected something that was dead and made it alive. Do you believe this? The second thing that you must get in order to get through your owl is not only do you need to know, but when you're in your middle, you've got to go. You got to know and you got to go. You go to him quickly. Everybody say quickly. 
Say quickly, quickly. Do it three times fast. <laughs> it's amazing what you will do. When it, it's, <laughs> pat your head, rub your belly. Anyway, verse 28. After, after she, Martha, had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and he's asking for you. And when Mary heard this, watch, she got up quickly and went to him. Now, Jesus had not yet entered to the village, but still at the place where Martha had met him. And when the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed, when they noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. Church. People get up out of church all the time, okay? I've been watching. I know every single one of you that's gotten up, gone to the bathroom. You let your kids walk around. I see it all, okay? I see you. In our, in our building down, down the street, it's a much smaller venue. I, you're, you're a little more discreet about it. You wait till I'm on this side of the stage, and then you try to sneak out. <laughs> or if you're, if you're a longtime Christian, you know that there's a prayer coming, so you wait for me to ask us to all bow your heads and close your eyes. And then there's a beeline for the door. I see it. Listen, we, we, we film everything. You're, you're caught. But at least they step out with the least amount of distraction as possible. And, but but, but if for, if, let me just say it this. My wife is up here on the front row. If she got up and sprinted down this middle aisle, nobody's going to be like, oh, she must really need to go to the bathroom. If she, listen, the, every usher, every prayer partner, every board member, everybody's going to be on her. Well, what's going on? What's going on, Janetta? Is everything okay? Why? Because of the urgency of her exit. What's the point? People will follow what they feel you feel is important. And if you feel it's important, people are going to follow you. Watch. The Bible says that Mary got up quickly and ran after Jesus and others followed her. Now, can I ask you a question? I just did. Can I ask you a question? <laughs> Sorry. Here's the question. Here's the real question. How, how about this? I want to make a statement. I'm going to ask you a question. Here's the question. Do you run after Jesus in such a manner that people want to know what all the fuss is about? Mm. Turn to your neighbor and say, that's good right there. Do you run after Jesus with such a fire and such a passion inside of you that people want to know about this Jesus that's living inside of you? Do, you? do you run after him when life hits you in the face, when you're in the middle of your mess, and the first thing that you do is fall on your face, and you find Jesus in the center? Do people want to know why? Do people want to know about the Jesus you serve? Do people want to know about the church you go to? Do people want to know about the Bible study that you lead? Do people want to know about the Bible that you read? Do people want to know? Because there's a difference inside of you. People don't notice. If people don't notice when you're running after Jesus, you're not running fast enough. We got to go to him quickly. Keep Jesus in your sights at all times. Listen, any counselor, secular or Christian, will tell you that the reason that your trial seems so heavy is because you have given them too much power. You have given them too much attention in your life. Every time you're focusing on that middle, every time you're focusing on that struggle, you are taking your attention off of the answer. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. We must be going after him. And when, you, and when you focus, when you're focused on your, on your issue, guess what? You are, you are empowering that problem a little more. And, you're, and it becomes the center of your uh, attention. And the smallest, the smallest issue, this, this rock, and I don't know where Tommy went. I, we stole this off of your property, but I will return it. But the, this, <laughs> Jesus, it's stealing in church. Okay, um. But, but the smallest, the smallest, the smallest obstacle close to your sight will block your vision of the cross. You can't see the answer because you're so focused on the middle 
There's a separator between you and the answer, and you've got it so zeroed in that you can't see the answer anymore. And listen, I want to tell you something. Jeanette, through her recovery, now this is partly because she refused to take pain medications. Anyway, um, but, but during, her, during her recovery, uh, when, she would, when she would go to stand up, she would get super dizzy very disoriented and feel like she was going to faint and fall fall down and and so she uh, so we asked the doctor we said doc this this is what's happening she gets dizzy she gets nauseous and but come on this doctor was not a christian he was far from it i tried to witness to him he didn't want anything to do with it but but here's the thing he's he said something very profound he said he said to us whenever she gets up tell her not to look down at her feet <laughs> but to keep her eyes up Oh man, look at that. I, I thought, I thought, Doc, that'll preach. That'll preach. You listen, when you feel like, when you feel like everything is spinning around you, stop looking at everything that's spinning. Get your eyes up. Keep your eyes focused. Look after him. Get your footing. Get going and go after him. Listen, this whole life we live is the middle. When you were born, that's the beginning. You will die. That's the end. And, and everything is in between is, is, is the middle. You're on a journey, and God has put before you this vast expanse of life that leads you to the way of eternity. So you may ask, well, how do you lay down that middle? How do you do that? How do you stop focusing on the pain? How do you stop focusing on those things? You go to him quickly. You go to him quick. It's really, you say, it's that simple? Yes, it's really that simple. He is our source and our strength and what our ever-present help in time of trouble. And when you do that, your spiritual eyes begin to improve. You know what Scripture says about the middle? It says that you're going to face trials and persecutions. You're going to face temptations. You're going to face hardships. But the Apostle Paul says that they are light and that they are building up for you an eternity, a glory that will outshine it all. In other words, he, 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 said, he says in, in 2 Corinthians 4, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Psalm chapter 30 verse 5 says, though the sorrows may last for a night, mm, the joy comes in the morning, church. Focus on that. Focus on that. I ain't dead yet. I ain't dead yet. I got oxygen in my lungs. I got a voice. I got eyes. I got ears. I can do it. I can give him praise. I can glorify him in the midst of my middle. So we get up. And we run after him in such a way that others are not focused on our owl. But they are, we are leading them to his wow. Amen. To the wow. To the awesomeness of God. I have one final thought for you and then we're going to. We're going to open up for prayer today. How you get through your owl, you, you, get, through, you get through it by, by uh, knowing him, by going after him. So you got to know, and you got to go, and finally you got to throw. You got to know, you got to go, and you got to throw. The last thing is you throw away that stone. Move the stone. Move the stone. What? Let's look at it. Verse 33. Jesus saw Mary and Martha weeping, and he saw the Jews who had come along with her, and they were weeping. And watch this. Jesus was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled, okay? Now watch this. We miss this oftentimes because we want, there's this famous uh, uh, verse in the Bible. It's the smallest verse in all the Bible. It's John chapter 11, verse 35. It's the smallest verse in the Bible, and it says that Jesus wept. But, but, but prior to that, Scripture says that he was moved and deeply troubled. And then he said, where have you laid him? He asked, come see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept, verse 35. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. Now, I wasn't going to talk about these few verses because of time, but, um, <laughs> hey, we're out here, and I, I'm, so we're, you know, uh, but I, I'm still watching you if you get up. So, <laughs> except for the one, the one family that told me they had a soccer game, and I told them, I said, you just better pray Jesus doesn't come back because he's not going to that soccer field to get you. 
No, I didn't. I'm messing. I'm joking, okay? That's what, that's what my, pre, my pastor used to say that I was growing. You better not go to the movie theater because if Jesus comes back, he's not coming in there after you. <laughs> it's amazing I'm a Christian today. But I wasn't going to talk about these verses. But, but in the middle, he, here's, the, re, here's the, the reality that Jesus faced that is so incredibly human. And all of us can relate with it. Because Jesus is in the middle of his earthly ministry. He's a year and a half into his ministry. He Listen, from verses, verses 12 through 21 are all about him being persecuted, crucified. Like th- That's the rest of the story. But he's in the middle. He's in this transitional state. He's in the middle of this book physically. And now he's in the middle of his own personal loss. And for all intents and purposes, this is the first owl that Jesus has experienced in his earthly ministry. And the Bible says in verse 35, which consequently is the very center of this chapter, he says, Jesus wept. Now, most people, including the Jewish followers of that day, believe that that Jesus uh, wept because of how much he loved Lazarus. And that may be true. But I have another thought for you this morning. You see, the Bible said prior that Jesus was deeply troubled in his spirit when he saw Mary and Martha and the Jewish followers weeping. I believe that he weeps because all that Mary and Martha and all those Jewish followers could see was a stone. I believe that they saw chapter 11. I believe that they saw the end. I believe that's what grieved Jesus was that when he said, I am the resurrection and the life, do you believe this? That because they had no grid for something that they could not see, their faith wasn't great enough to believe him for their right now. And and church, I want to tell you something. All they could see was a stone. All they could see was death. The last chapter, case closed, no more hope. And I wonder how many of you here this morning can relate to Mary and Martha. I wonder how many of you had faith, but now all you see is a stone. And like them, that stone represents something. For you, it's the line in the sand. Can I tell you that when you are focused on the stone, it makes Jesus weep. Because you have limited his power in your life to the first 10 chapters. You're saying, God, you were strong enough, and if you'd have shown up then, but now this problem is too big for you. This stone is too heavy. This mountain is too large. So Jesus does what only Jesus can do, and he deputizes the the people on the scene to exercise their faith, and he's about to take them to a new level. He sees the same stone that they see. He's fully aware that on the other side of that stone is death, Lazarus, who's been there for four days. He's fully aware that that decomposing body smells. It's complicated. It's difficult. It's putrid. And he is also fully aware that in order to get out of the middle, you have to eliminate the thing that is separating death from life. Come on, church. The thing that was separating death from life was that stone. And so Jesus says to them, it says, it says the, the, there was a cave in the cave, had a stone laid across the entrance. In verse 39, Jesus said, take away the stone. So some, some of you are like Mary and Martha and the Jewish people. You had faith for, to Jesus in a point. If he had shown up a little bit sooner, you could have healed it. He could have saved it, could have delivered it. He could have done something with this stone. The writer of Hebrews sums up this whole thing in one in two verses in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, when he says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. That's the throw. And he let us run with perseverance. That's the go. The race marked out for us fixing our eyes on who you know, Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. This great quarry, this whole quarry walk, this whole plaza that we are enjoying and that we've celebrated here today, 
Can I tell you something? They, this was a functioning, actual quarry. It's not called the quarry walk for nothing. <laughs> and if you're a, a local resident, you've seen that quarry over the years. And, and their, their lease had come up and they were no longer able to, to mine from here or to quarry the rock from this, this place. And so for all intents and purposes, business had to come to a halt. And instead of saying, well, that's the end. No more quarry. Guess we got to just go try to find a part-time job somewhere. Instead of that, they said, hmm, we could build a center. We could put a grocery store in. We could, we could, have, we, we could build a green for community events and have condominiums over here for people to come and live in restaurants and places that, uh, like the wellness center and the spa to help people. And, 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 and the only thing that we have to do is move that mountain. I mean, remember the mountain. Listen, I, I, told, I told Mr. Haynes, I used to come out when the post office was over here, I used to come over and just watch them just chow that mountain down. It was incredible. They literally moved the mountain. It was awesome. They moved the stone. And they moved the one obstacle that separated this from being an abandoned quarry to making it a place that's breathing new life into a town. And so the difference in, in that was that the giant stone had to be moved. Do you realize the size of that stone? Perhaps you have limited the power of God to work in your life because you're, in your heart you have sealed things up with a stone. And you've said, there's no more hope. I might as well just stay in chapter 11. The, the other side of the stone stinks. On the other side of that stone is a mess. It's too big. It's too expensive. It's too painful. It's too putrid. But I came here to tell you something this morning. If you want to see God's glory in your life, you got to move the stone. You got to throw the stone. I'm just kidding. <laughs> you got to throw the stone. You say, well, how do you do that? I already told you how. Have the faith that God is who he says that he is. That he, that he is a God that will, that the God that you serve is big enough, not just for the first half of your life, but he's big enough for your middle and he's big enough for the last half of your life. There is no circumstance, no problem, no issue, no hardship, no difficulty that you cannot show God's glory in and through your life. Jesus is here and he just, got to determine that no matter what you are going to run to his presence go after him urgently find yourself with him every day every moment no matter what the circumstances get going keeping your eyes up not focusing on the stone because the answer to your prayer is not on the other side of the stone the pro that is on the other side of the stone is not on the other side of the stone let me be clear The answer to your prayer is not on the other side of the stone. Death is on the other side of that stone. The promise of God is in your faith. It rests in your faith to remove the stone. Your, Jesus is your answer. By the way, the stones in your life, the stones in your life are a smoke screen. It's the devil's way of stealing, killing, and destroying your dreams and your future, telling you you can't, you shouldn't, you don't deserve it, you never will. You're too bad. You've lived, you've lived a horrible life. All the, all the lies. It's a smoke screen. So stop looking at the stone and instead start standing on the stone that the builders rejected, the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Move the stone, he said. In other words, have enough faith in this seemingly case-closed situation that you will know that no matter what issue you may have to travel through, that he is with you, he is for you, and everything that's going to happen through you is for the glory of God. And when you do, you can live life, according to John chapter 10, verse 10, a life fully alive, a Zoe life that is full and that is rich and that is whole, church. I'm going to ask the worship team if they would make their way back up to the, to the platform. And while they're coming, I'm going to invite you to stand with me. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Remember that before Jesus went to go see Lazarus, he prophesied that that sickness would not end in death. Remember that, 11.4. Yes, Lazarus experienced death for four days, but that wasn't the end. That wasn't the end. See, I want, I want to tell you something this morning. Your situation may look like death. It may smell like death. It may even appear like death from every angle. But if you know God and you and you and and throw uh, throw every, off everything and you have the authority. If you throw off everything that has authority over in your life that has authority uh, over Jesus in your life. And you, and you will begin to empower Jesus and not empower that situation. Then watch this verse 41. So they obey. They took away the stone and Jesus huh, looked up. Jesus looked up. Jesus looked up. Amen. Jesus looked to the Father and he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And then he said in verse 42, I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. Jesus is teaching us something here. If you will believe him to be in the middle to be in the middle of your life to be the resurrection if you will go to him and stay in his presence if you will take away that stone then through the power of Jesus the resurrection and the life you have the authority to speak into your dead circumstances and have the power to see life breathed into them again Jesus said it says this in verse 4 that when Jesus had said all this, he called out in a loud voice. He didn't, he wasn't dignified. Lazarus. <clears throat> Excuse me, Lazarus, if you're not too busy. It says, Lazarus, come forth. Come out, Lazarus. In other words, he's saying, sickness, be healed. He, he, he was saying, loneliness, be have relationships. He was saying, mountain, be removed. Pain, be gone. Fear, become faith. Doubt, become joy. In a loud voice, in authority, speak to your situation that limits God in your life with the power that is within you. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13 tells us you have the power to do that. I can do all things, all things, all things through Christ who gives me strength. Remember the same Jesus that turned the water into wine and the stones into bread and the fed the 5,000 and healed the lame and the blind and delivered the demon. It's the same Jesus that defeated death. Defeated death. Defeated death. He defeated death. He defeated hell. He defeated death. He defeated hell. And he defeated the grave. And because he lives, you can live also. That's what it means to be whole. Jesus wants us to be well. So my question to you today is, is it well with your soul? Is it well with your soul? The worship team's going to play, and we're going to open these altars. I'd like to ask my uh, altar workers if they make their way to the front. We also have a prayer tent in the back. If you're new and you're not comfortable, we'll come in front, in front of people. We got people in the back that would love to pray with you. Maybe you need to come and wrestle with, a, with, with your own Lazarus situation, your own middle, and you just need prayer. Maybe your soul is not well today. Can I tell you, Jesus is your answer. If you Listen, if you missed everything else, if your child was bothering you through the whole service and you couldn't pay attention, hear me very clearly. Jesus Christ loves you just as you are. He died on a cross for you while you were a sinner. He wants to set you free from your sins. He wants to deliver you from your past. The Bible says that when you receive Christ as Savior, that the old man passes away and all things become new. Amen? There's freedom in this tent today. There's freedom on this green today. It's up to you to make the decision. Is it well with your soul? Let's sing and pray today.
Father, we praise you this morning. Father, we praise you this morning. Lord, we thank you that no matter what situation we find ourselves in the midst of, God, that your grace is sufficient. Father, that your strength is more than enough for us. Lord, that you are the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Father, I pray for those that need encouragement, that they come in here defeated. Lord, I pray that you would speak encouragement to their heart. Lord, I pray for those that need physical healing in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray that your mighty hand would move this morning. Father, that those that need relational breakthrough, financial breakthrough, God, I pray that you would pour out so much blessing that they don't have enough room to store it. Lord, that there would be no mistake where that blessing came from. Father, we thank you for the sweet gift of your spirit that's been in this place this morning. We love you, Jesus. We love you. We love you. Amen. Amen. Why don't you give the Lord a hand this morning, church?